three, four, five, ten, whatever, like in the Kabbalah and the Sephiroth, it's ten. So then it, it explains in detail how that system works. There's a chapter on the Druidic tree alphabet, because the Druids, we work with, with different, um, each sound is a different tree, and he gives them all here. Um, he talks about, um, you know, the, the Chinese system and the I Ching, which works with the different hexagrams, 64 hexagrams. He gives them all, explains them. So it's a sort of mathematical key to the table. And well done, Bill. I mean, it's a great, great work he's done. Um, <clears throat> and lots of study resources given. Right. Those are just some of the, some of the books I've used for making the table. I've given you a little sample. I mean, here in the library, there's, there's thousands of books that I've gathered over 30 years of book collecting on all aspects of comparative global philosophy. Um, and I think what, what I'm trying to do here, why I'm so excited to run this philosophy club, is to try and use wisdom and philosophy to solve the problems of the planet. That's why I run the World Intellectual Wisdom Forum, because what we're trying to do as intellectuals is say to the planet, look, we don't have to fight, we don't have to have invasions like Putin's done to Ukraine. God forbid, you know, a war between America and China and the West. I mean, nightmare. We'd all be living in caves and getting radio radioactive sickness, you know, and only a handful of us would survive. I don't want that for my children or my grandchildren. I want my children and grandchildren to be able to live in a world where philosophy is discussed and appreciated. And all the traditions are valued and loved. Be it the Maori or the ancient Phoenician or the American Indian or whatever. <clears throat> okay, that's my little plug. The whole reason for doing this is to bring peace. Right, having said all that, that's my preamble. Now it's over to you to, to say which two you want me to look at first. Okay. Um, we've been d d doing a lot of primal boxes. Yeah. But I still want to add one more. Mm. Number 12. Right. Fino, a creek, Magyar, Siberian. Okay. And exactly the opposite. Ah. Epicureanism. <laughs> Oh, right. Okay, that's fun. So, like, we're going at opposite poles. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. Yes, there's, we can do a sort of geometric pattern here, can't we? Yeah. So, the primal religion, number 12, we'll start with them. Um, <clears throat> so, this is an interesting one. So, the, the um, finno ugric language is, is that it's a language family that um, includes Finnish... Um, I've not been to Finland, but I've had friends who are Finnish, and I've studied the Kalevala, which is the Finnish um, sacred text, and which was written down in the 19th century only. It was an oral tradition memorised by bards, and then a chap called Lonerot, who was a romantic folktale collector like the Brothers Grimm. He, he went around and, and wrote it down, and it was published, and I've got a copy of it. And... It tells these magical adventures in the ancient times of, um, <clears throat> you know, different sages, different gods, actually, who, who um, come and go in the storyline. And there are witches and there are weddings and there are quests. You know, it's like an adventure game, really. I'm sure there is a Califala adventure game online somewhere that you can do. Um, now, <clears throat> that was taken from a still-living shamanic tradition um, because the gods in, are sort of in, interwoven with human lives. It's very, very ancient, these tales. And what they've discovered is that they come from ancient shamanic traditions which were from the circumpolar region, stretching all the way to Siberia. Um, so it's, and there are different tribes speaking these languages, finno ugric that are in all those regions. Um, and they have similar sorts of stories, similar tales. And it goes back to um, prehistoric times, these cultures. Um, one of the most sacred things for them is the water birds, um, because it's quite, you know, the, the, um, the swan and other water birds that fly about are like magical creatures for them. And you find this, this motif occurs of the beautiful maiden who turns into a swan. 
and, and you fall in love with her and then she comes back and is a woman again, that kind of thing. And in fact, creation came from the swan's egg that creates this world. So the swan is a mother goddess in, in this tradition. Um, well, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a very ancient tradition. Now, what's interesting is that Hungarian or Magyar people come from the same lineage. The Magyars, um, who live in Hungary now, were, were those same tribes, but they took to riding horses. And they moved south and they came into Europe and they nearly conquered the whole of Europe. They're pretty fierce. But the, um, <clears throat> I think it was a Roman general managed to defeat them. And um, they, they went and settled in Hungary instead. Um, and when I was in Hungary one time, I was visiting Budapest, which is obviously the capital on the, on the uh, Danube. And I went to a performance in a theatre which is up on the hill overlooking the Danube um, in a beautiful concert hall. And I saw a plaque on the wall saying Beethoven performed his piano concerto number whatever first ever here in 1820 or something. Um, so it's quite a famous place. This, this was a shamanic singer, Hungarian, who was doing these ancient shamanic type songs. Like it was like a whole orchestra of magical sounds was coming out of her mouth. Um, I think it was, it was maybe there were a couple of them. And then there was a backdrop and, and lighting effects. And she was like reconstructing this very primordial landscape <clears throat> through sound, like the shamans do. And I went because it was billed in the programme, you know, this is a, a, a living tradition in Hungary of these Magyar folk singers that do this thing. And it was, it was amazing. It was sort of makes your hair stand up to, to listen to it. Um, so I have great respect for these, these traditions. And um, in the book, you can read more about them. And, and there are people that are rediscovering these ancient shamanic paths and trying to, um, you know, reactivate the, the, the wisdom there, um, including in Siberia. And I read recently that there's some magicians in Siberia that want to separate from Russia. They're not happy with Putin's war. They want Siberia to become independent and they don't want to go and kill the Ukrainians. I think that's a jolly good idea. I think independent Siberia and get the shamans of Siberia to you know, um, set up their own um, independent free state of Siberia. Uh, that's a jolly good idea. Because us shamans and druids, we don't want wars. We want to live in peace. We want rather the vertical ascent. Because the point of shamanism is that although we appear to be stuck in these bodies, it's, it's kind of, um, that's a temporary illusion. Our immortal spirits are temporarily housed in these, in these bodies and can, if you learn how to do it and train yourself or you take the right substances or you get the right teaching, you can learn how to fly beyond the body. So they can do what's called, um, you know, astral traveling or, um, you know, <coughs> leaving the body. Keeping the body intact, you know, you're still lying there asleep and happy. But you can then go traveling all around the universe and you can, you can do good works when you're in your etheric body. And so the shamans would then go and look for lost souls, help people who've had nervous breakdowns, help people that are dying of cancer, help people who are dying to give them a safe passage, help people that want to conceive and haven't got any souls. So you bring in a soul and give it to the couple, you know. So you can do all kinds of stuff when you're out of body as a shaman. And that's what these people do. I mean, and anthropologists have studied them, um, you know, um, and compared and contrasted them. And that's what these shamans have been doing ever since humanity first started on the, um, you know, munching the apple of wisdom, to use the biblical metaphor. Um, and I think that's much more fun, doing this vertical ascension than killing and, you know, bashing people on the head with, with weapons. I mean, that's so primitive. And, the, you know, the Russian people should get rid of this Putin guy. He's a madman. Um, in the, um, there's a wonderful museum in Petersburg. I've not been to St. Petersburg, but I've been to Moscow, which has one of the biggest anthropological collections in the world because Russian anthropologists went to Siberia in 
course of the last couple of hundred years, interviewing all these shamans, and they recorded them. They even filmed them in little black and white photographic um, film sequences, talking to shamans, and they filmed their ceremonies and their magic rituals. It was Russians that pioneered all that stuff. And, you know, it's great. It's all there. And when I was in Slovenia, I saw an exhibition that had come down of shamanic um, accoutrements. Like, like, they all have these magical jackets with embroidery and, and drum, special drums that they, they bang with rhythm. That's the absolute must-have thing for a shaman. Um, I've got my own drum over there. And so, <clears throat> and it was visiting Slovenia when I was there from Russia. Well, I'd rather we did that kind of thing, like museums visiting each other's countries than, than bashing each other. Why didn't Kiev and Moscow do some sort of twinning of museums and, and go and talk philosophy with each other? The problem is the Putin guy. He's got to go um, and his ilk and get Russia back onto the, you know, the wisdom. Of, or Siberia's going to go independent. Right, so that's that one. And then contrasting it with the total opposite, philosophy, Epicureanism. Okay, it's named after Epicurus, who was a Greek sage who lived in Athens in the middle of like the um, third century BC. <clears throat> and he had a nice house in the middle of, garden, uh, middle of Athens with a lovely garden out the back, a bit like me here. And he used to have philosophical discussions in the garden. Um, he, had a, he ran his own little philosophy club, basically. <laughs> and people would come there and, and have, you know... I mean, Athens is beautiful because the weather's brilliant and the cicadas sing all night long. I mean, I've sat outside in Athens and it's just a die for at night. And um, Epicurus was there and he, his, his teaching was don't worry about understanding everything. You can't. It's too much to understand. Don't forget, this is before the internet and before my table. So, you know, it was you were limited to scrolls back in those days, and they all had to be handwritten. So, so <clears throat> you know, but even then there was a lot. Like if you went to Alexandria, the library was already created in his time. There were tens of thousands of scrolls, enough. You couldn't read them all in a lifetime. But he said, no, limit your your scope. Be content with what you have and take pleasure in it. The, the purpose of life, after all, is to be happy. To take pleasure in simple things, a good glass of wine, a, a, a great lecture, a friendship, um, you know, going to an art exhibition, falling in love, um, going for a walk, holding hands in the sunset. Simple things like that. That's the, the meaning of life, said Epicurus. So the term Epicureanism became somebody that loves life somebody that's on the side of life, isn't trying to destroy it, doesn't hate life, doesn't want to kill anyone, doesn't want to kill themselves, doesn't want to destroy anything, you know, accepts life as it is and, and loves it. And that was, that's the tradition of Epicurus. Um, now, he also had a complicated sort of physics. He believed in atomic theory. He was quite sophisticated intellectually. He felt that we are made of atoms, which is a word he used, and these atoms congregate and make, you know, the patterns of matter. Um, he couldn't quite work out why the atoms have decided to take the forms they do. Why do some atoms decide to become flames, others become a human being? Obviously, he didn't, under, you know, it was a long time ago, they didn't, they didn't understand the complexity of atomic theory that we now do in physics and chemistry. But he was on the right track. He, he kind of knew that something was going on at a micro level that we can't quite see. And of course, he didn't have microscopes and things. But basically, his argument was, just, you know, leave it. The atoms are doing their thing. They're fine. The world is, is good. These atoms have decided to do this thing of having a world and a life. Most of it's beautiful. If we can just tune in to the inner frequencies behind it all and act in harmony with it, we'll lose our fear, we'll lose our anger, we'll lose our hatred. Even the Putin types will lose their anger and their egotism. So, so for him, to be enlightened meant to live in harmony with, with 
with nature's uh, beauty. Um, and ever since then you've had, so I've got in the box, I've said there's about a million people now that would call themselves Epicureans. That's people that don't really, they're not too fussed about, you know, how many reincarnations they've had or how many different languages there are and what are all the words for justice in all the languages. You know, it's, no, they're just happy having a good time, um, going to the cinema, going to the theatre, having parties, um, <clears throat> dancing, you know, at least once a week. So an Epicurean is someone that delights in the pleasures of life. Um, and there's quite a few of them in, in, well, scattered about in all cultures, but not in such a way that harms other people. Epicurus was a believer in ethics, so you don't steal to have pleasure. You know, you don't rob from other people. No, you, you, you act ethically, and within your capacity, you, you try and enjoy life as much as possible. Now, I think these two are compatible. I think that the shamans of, of Siberia, of Finland, of Hungary, and that amazing tradition, I think... You know, our ancestors didn't, didn't carry on with the human experiment so that we could all be suffering. They didn't... I mean, think how many women have given birth to our ancestors over these hundreds of thousands of years. Um, they didn't go through all that pain in order that we should then kill each other and act disgracefully. They, they did it so that we could find pleasure in each other's company and well-being and build a society where where that's normal, you know, where people are taken care of if they're old and sick, like in these ancient shamanic societies. Um, <coughs> so I can see there is a link, you know. Yes, and I'm sure, obviously, um, Epicurus didn't know about all the complexities of, of the shamanic traditions that way up north, but they did know about someone called Abaris, who was a friend of Pythagoras, who was from the place of Hyperborea, um, beyond the North Wind. And they knew there were these kind of magicians called shamans. So I'm sure Epicurus knew, you know, he'd heard of them. And he would have been very happy to meet them, I'm sure. They would have got on fine. Um, right, okay, thank you. That's an interesting couple. Uh, thank you, yeah. that's great. Mm. Sure. Good, let's do the next one. Okie dokie. Mm, so, so, so. Uh, okay, something esoteric? You know me, I'm always up for an esoteric. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, 116 Freemasonry Grand Orient. Okay, right. And ah. next to them. over here. For one, Moism. Okay. That's the Chinese one? Yes. 41? Yeah. Okay. Right. Good. Well, the Grand Orient Freemasonry one. No, we'll do Moism first, okay. because that's the older one. Um, so, Mo Tzu, the founder of this, is um, was a Chinese sage who... <clears throat> kind of came slightly after Confucius and Lao Tzu, but around about the same time, who founded Confucianism and Taoism, respectively. Came from the same thought world, obviously wrote in Chinese. Um, he disagreed with Confucius, who said that it's very important in society to, to pay attention to the correct mores and manners and customs of the... Um, the people you're living among, and to be very respectful to your superiors. And a husband and wife should, should have a sort of almost like a ritual respect for each other and a, and a deference 
Um, Motsu felt that, although he appreciated the good bits about Confucius, he felt that that really it would be simple if we all just loved each other. He felt the universal principle of love is what should engineer our relationships. If you love your neighbour, <coughs> you don't have to worry about are they richer than you, are they more powerful, are they in a better class of society, therefore you should speak to them in polite tones or whatever. If, if you just love each other, all that will happen naturally. You'll find your natural level, um, said Motsu. So in, in many ways, um, he, was, he was very similar to Christ's teachings, actually, although he lived 400 years before Christ. Because Christ said essentially the same thing. Just love each other and everything else will be added unto you. you know. Motsu said exactly the same. <clears throat> the difference was that Motsu wasn't crucified and didn't have that amazing, you know, kind of dramatic plot twist of the resurrection. Uh, Motsu just lived a normal life, said love each other, and then died off. And so he didn't become such a big thing in Chinese thought. And China decided to go more with the Confucian tradition and the Taoist tradition. But anyway, he's an interesting thinker. Um, but <clears throat> in some ways, I wish the Chinese could rediscover him. Because um, I think that Chairman Mao and his brutal communist regime, which killed and massacred millions of people ruthlessly, um, you know, uh, including Confucian sages and scholars, um, did so in, in the name of fake um, brotherhood, universal brotherhood. I mean, the idea behind communism is great. It's, it's basically Moism. But it was applied through force, which I think is wrong. You can't force people to love each other. Um, and so I wish China could re remember Motsu and bring out some you know, new edition of his works. And I expect there's a few philosophers in the University of Beijing still studying him, probably in Taiwan as well, where they have a bit more intellect, well, a lot more intellectual freedom. Um, so I don't know, maybe, I'm sure in Rome at the next World Congress of Philosophy there might be a few papers on Motsu, and I'll go along and listen, see who's doing, doing that work. So that's the Chinese one. Um, <clears throat> and the esoteric one you mentioned, the Grand Orient one. So this is very interesting tradition. Frank, Franck Maçonnerie, as they say in France, came to France in the middle, in the course of the 18th century, 1800s. Um, historians of Freemasonry, of which I count, I think, as one, although I haven't published that much on it, but I've studied it for years and taught it, um, debate, you know, where was the origins of Freemasonry um, as an organised tradition. Um, it, certainly, it certainly came to France from Scotland and from Great Britain. We know that quite a few Jacobite exiles who'd been kicked out of Britain because they were, you know, um, um, well, they were Roman Catholic. They were too intellectual for the, for the average um, London merchant that just wanted to look at their profits and their banking system and didn't care about you know, um, spirituality. So they kicked out the king, James II, who um, came to France and lived in Saint-Germain-en-Laye in a chateau which the king of France gave him. Now, with him, he brought lots of interesting people, some of whom were Freemasons and intellectuals. The Jacobite court in exile was a hotbed of this esoteric Christianity. They believed in, like... Yes, Christianity is wonderful, the symbols, the mass, the rituals, but there's also got to be an inner transformation, if you want, the Christification of, of each believer. Um, and that can be done with the help of certain Masonic rituals, which involved um, the, the mythography of building Solomon's temple. And you took various degrees, three grades of initiation, um, and um, one, of the, one of the first Freemasons, very important guy, was a guy called Chevalier Ramsey, who helped introduce Freemasonry to France. 
He was a Scottish intellectual. He was a universal <coughs> thinker, a universal Christian. Like me, he was both Catholic and Protestant at the same time. Um, born in Scotland. Spoke fluent Latin. He was educated to a high level. He studied at the University of Glasgow. And he wanted universal salvation for everybody. Not just for the chosen few. Not for just this box or that box or this religion or that religion. How can we create a system whereby everybody wins? And he wrote books about this, you know, um, <clears throat> which was sort of borderline heretical because most of the traditions say, no, 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 somebody's got to lose. You know, we're, we're going to win. Otherwise, why would you join their club if, if you know? Um, <clears throat> but this guy, Shvalia Ramsey, said, no, no, we, we want everyone to win in the end. <laughs> and... Um, <clears throat> So he saw Freemasonry as a vehicle to do this, because it's open to everybody. It doesn't matter your wealth, your, your status, um, even your religion. In Freemasonry, you can be Christian or Jewish or Muslim or Sikh or anything. It's become a vehicle of universal salvation. And um, I first discovered Chevalier Ramsey when I um, read a wonderful book called The, um, the Ancient Theology years ago in London. Um, by a British scholar who, who had a wonderful chapter on Ramsey's philosophy, which is what I'm talking about. And his wife, he was married to a beautiful woman who used to call him mon cher Zoroaster. My dear Zoroaster, in French. They, they, they must have had such fun. Um, because he, you know, he can be a Zoroastrian and a Freemason as well. And Zoroaster, the, the purple Persian religion ones, that's a pretty ancient religion, you know. So why wouldn't you want a kind of a, a system that could allow everyone to join and then you'd be graded according to your intellectual and ethical progress? Surely that would be better than having everyone in separate little clubs all fighting each other. So that grew into what's called the Grand Orient <clears throat> and it became a big thing. Most of the intellectuals in France in the 1700s joined this new thing that was going on. Chevalier Ramsey gave an oration in Saint-Germain, which has come down, the words have come down to us, which is one of the best philosophical overviews of what Freemasonry stands for. And he said what I've been saying, you know, it's a, a, it's a path of initiation for universal salvation for all, all humanity. And it's for all people of learning, of good manners, good repute, um, you know, who, who are trying to do good in the world. Um, <clears throat> And it's still being studied today by Masonic historians. Other people, other intellectuals joined in France. So Montesquieu, one of the great philosophers of France from Bordeaux, there was a Masonic lodge in Bordeaux. He became a member. The Paris lodge became full of all the intellectuals of the day. This was what we call the Enlightenment in France. And it was the era of the, the philosophers, the philosophes. Um, and many of the great, many of them were scientists like Lavoisier, who discovered oxygen, um, mathematicians, um, people doing amazing things, were inspired by their commitment to Freemasonry. Freemasonry said, and Ramsey agreed, that it was itself not a new religion. It was a, it was a resurfacing of a very ancient wisdom tradition that is the core wisdom tradition of all humanity. So... All, you know, Pythagoras, all the sages of ancient Greece, of Phoenicia, of Rome, are honoured within the Masonic tradition. Um, and in Israel, King Solomon and all the sages of, of the Bible, they're all honoured. And Christ, of course, as, I mean, there's some wonderful passages in, in the New Testament when he uses the symbol of building as a kind of metaphysical building. Um, and St. Paul uses that as well a metaphor we're all living stones in the temple of god that image comes up so we're all we're all as one humanity trying to build the temple of god on this planet um, which will be sacred and will not have violence in it will not have racism and hatred and ignorance you know so that's what a freemason is um, i've been studying it for years because my um, the mother of my two youngest children, her father was a Grand Master and a senior Freemason who I met back in the 80s and inherited some of his books and 
when I was in London in the 80s studying Freemasonry. It was very interesting. <clears throat> I decided not to join the Lodge because I wanted to have total academic freedom. I joined the Lodge of Academics instead. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, you know, I, I greatly respect my Freemasonic brothers. And that's why I was annoyed at Benedict saying they're evil. That's just an ignorant thing to say. Um, sorry, Benedict. I did go to his mass in Glasgow, but, oh dear. And he, he was running the equivalent of the Inquisition, which still lives on the propaganda thing in Rome. Um, you know, silly, silly stuff, really. Um, <clears throat> so, if you're interested in the Grand Orient and you get a chance to get a plane or a train ticket to Paris, which I recommend strongly, go to the Museum of the Grand Orient in Paris, which is their headquarters. There's a great bookshop next door, which is worth spending a day in. Um, and the Grand Orient has an amazing library, which I've spent time in. And it has a museum open to the public. And it has regalia from the history of Freemasonry in France, right up to the present time. Um, and it's really interesting. You know, a lot of the great statesmen and leaders of French cultural life have been members of the Grand Orient. It's open to people to join. And to join and advance up the grades, you have to do, like, a lecture. You have to do some, you know, writing and memorise the rituals and all kinds of things. It's a sort of philosophical... Um, school, if you want. Um, and you can be of any religious dispensation. It's not compulsory to be of this or that religion. Um, and there are lodges all over France connected with this, in, including here in La Creuse um, and in Limoges places. Um, <clears throat> and the, one of the most amazing of the offshoots of this was the Lodge of the Nine Sisters, which was in Paris, in the late 18th century, and its secretary was um, an amazing um, intellectual um, who um, was called Antoine Cor de Gébelin, and his father was a pastor from Lausanne, Protestant, and he was the secretary who was corresponding with all the members, not just in France, but abroad. People abroad joined it. They had to be Freemasons, and then they would be corresponding members. And they included some of the greatest intellectuals of the day, Thomas Jefferson in America, Benjamin Franklin, um, Jeremy Bentham in London, um, people in Spain, people in Russia, you know, joined. And it was called the UNESCO of the 18th century. UNESCO is based in Paris. This was like a proto-UNESCO for the savants, the intellectuals. Um, when the Nazis invaded Paris in the... Um, 1940s, they stole everything they could get, get from the um, Grand Orient headquarters. They took it all back to Germany. And, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the head of propaganda for the Nazis was put in charge of destroying Freemasonry in Europe because they did not want freedom. The thing that Freemasons are very big on is like your own work through your own initiations in your own time in a brotherhood, right? Um, and a sisterhood, because women can join in France. Um, but they're very much against racism and the suppression of one minority by, by another, whereas the Nazis' ethos was built on that. You know, they wanted to kill all the Jews, for God's sake, whereas a lot of Jews in France were Freemasons and elsewhere in Europe. So <clears throat> in Czech, Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia, there were lots of Freemasons in in um, Republican Spain and elsewhere. And wherever the fascists and Nazis went, they tried to kill them all, which is shocking. I mean, I've just been writing in, for a book I'm working on about Hitler's, <coughs> you know, hatred of Freemason, but also Mussolini and Franco hated Freemasons. Fascism was deliberately designed to stamp them out because what fascism wanted was the state should be all powerful. You don't have rights as an individual you only have rights as a member of the state. And the, pa 